Hello, Trinity Western University. This is Vince Bantu, and it is a blessing to be with you uh, in this lecture that is entitled Gospel Hymenote. Um, and it's a great uh, privilege to be here again. Um, I, I had the pleasure of, of, of addressing uh, some folks here before on the uh, the question of Christ, uh, on the issue of Christianity always being a global religion. And uh, in a way, this is a follow up to that uh, in this conversation on Gospel Hymenote as uh, and also bringing out some of the themes uh, in uh, my second book entitled Gospel Hymenote. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, what what is meant by this phrase Gospel Hymenote as well as how it connects even follows up with uh, for those that were able to catch the last conversation on Christianity always being a global religion. Um, the, the phrase Gospel Hymenote is actually uh, a refers to a theological paradigm that's been with us for for quite some time. Uh, the uh, the word hymenote is actually um, a word that it it exists in various East African languages, especially in Ethiopia and Eritrea, and um, and it's actually related to as as many of these languages are Semitic. It's actually related to similar words uh, in other Semitic languages like Arabic and Hebrew and and Syriac, uh, and it refers to uh, faith and um, uh, in, a, in a very holistic kind of way. It actually can mean a lot of different things like faith or doctrine uh, or theology is kind of the way in which we're, uh, you know, I'm using it in this work and in this conversation. Um, it can also mean lifestyle or conduct. And, uh, and it's a very holistic word that has to do with, um, again, how our beliefs and our, our doctrine, our teaching, uh, and the theology that we're committed to has to do with our behavior and our lifestyle and our, and our worship and everything about our religious life. And, um, and so that's what's really meant by, uh, by Hymenote uh, and using it uh, also as, a, as an equivalent for theology. But, uh, but again, it has a very holistic sense. And, and what's meant by, uh, so in a sense of saying gospel theology or gospel Hymenote, What's meant by a gospelist uh, theology or a, a gospelist perspective on, on Christianity and Christian witness is one that is also equally holistic. Um, one of the things that we get into a lot in this book is the way that um, theology, in as it's primarily practiced in kind of the dominant Western world, um, is has been really kind of... Um, bifurcated or or there's been a binary created in Christian theological discourse that has for the most part kind of divided along liberal or conservative or um, uh, lines that emphasize you know on one hand emphasizing truth and orthodoxy and right belief and right doctrine and on the other hand emphasizing right action and justice and uh, social equality and social praxis and uh, and there this is a, a divide that's really uh, a result of kind of the Western Enlightenment and um, and and kind of post Enlightenment European industrialism that that kind of led into the creation of theological liberalism in Europe and then came over into America and and where you had um, even in seminaries and even denominations uh, in the early 20th century in the states uh, splitting along this kind of liberal conservative um, binary and uh, even uh, Christian nonprofits and, and seminaries and divinity schools. And this is even where you had the seminary movement of schools reacting to um, and, and kind of both sides digging their heels deeper into this binary. And, and again, part of, the, part of the problem with this uh, is that it really, this, this dichotomy misses, again, the holistic nature of, of Christianity as it's presented in scripture. Uh, Jesus himself, when he was asked what the greatest commandment was, said that uh, th that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it, uh, to love your neighbor as yourself. And so uh, we see in scripture that that it's impossible to, to either separate or uh, kind of subordinate the call of the church to to social justice and to liberation and to and also the uh, the clear example in scripture of the of God's preferential option for the poor and the oppressed, that it's impossible to separate that from right belief and right theology and right social praxis, that these things go together. Um, even though for the most part in, in Christendom and also in theological academia and output, they're often really kind of separated and, and, and it's an either or kind of thing. And, and, and part of what's being argued, and, and, and again, a lot of that has to do with going some of the things we talked about in the first lecture about how Christianity has been largely appropriated by this kind of uh, imperial uh, dominating Western uh, view 
and how in the modern world this kind of liberalism is a is a reaction against that uh and 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 in this kind of mutual reacting there's a there's a missing that's happening of the biblical vision of shalom that again cannot separate the uh the call of the church to be identifying with uh the liberation of the oppressed and and, and the poor with right theology and right uh re relationships with between humanity and god that can only happen through the uh redemption that comes through faith in christ um and 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 also as we mentioned in the last lecture despite the fact that in many ways christianity has been appropriated and associated with kind of a dominant imperial cultural identity that's not the origins of our faith and that's not the um even the predominant witness of it, even though sometimes it might be the most powerful or well-funded or loudest expression of Christendom, that there's a distinction between Christendom and Christianity uh, and that we're going to talk about. And, and so again, this, this, uh, this idea of gospel hymenote as being a holistic expression of Christianity, uh, it really, um, I want to bring out some examples of how that's been lived out, especially in the black church and also uh, in the history of African Christianity. Uh, but that's by no means the only um, uh, expression of that, because again, the origins of our faith is holistic. It goes back again to the scriptures uh, that we see, um, you know, all over uh, the, the Old and New Testament, a clear call for a right relationship with God through orthodox and right belief, and also a clear call for uh, entering into the cause of justice and, and um, identifying with and standing in solidarity with the poor and the oppressed. Uh, that this is clearly what, what as James says uh, in, uh, in his epistle, right religion, <laughs> to do justice for the poor and the widows, um, and that this is what holistic or gospelist religion is. And I want to talk a little bit about how, despite the fact that um, that's, that a lot of Christianity has been uh, kind of now associated with the protection of power and the maintenance of power, especially in the Western world, that that's, that, that's not the, um, the totality of the story. Now again, I wanted to I want to focus on Africa just because that's like a lot of and, and African American religion because that's my a lot of my specialty. But again, um, um, there's a lot of other witnesses to that. But I want to I want to frame uh, a lot of African Christianity as well as African American Christianity uh, Christianity as a a witness to the origins of our faith. Um, uh, so not the originators of, but a witness to and a reflection of the holistic vision of the kingdom of God uh, and, the, and the holistic vision of what it means to be the church um, that, that really originates in scripture and that many other uh, members of the body of Christ have also witnessed to. Um, but as, but um, uh, I wanna, again, looking at Africa and the way in which Christianity spread, um, I, I want to just make a couple of important points about the, the history of the gospel in Africa. Um, we talked a lot in the first lecture about how Christianity kind of developed and uh, in, 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 in some ways uh, in the Western world with a specific focus on how Christianity became seen as a literally a product of the Western world. And, and we talked a little bit about how that has created missiological and evangelistic difficulties for sharing the gospel for many people in African and, and communities of African descent, as well as others uh, as, um, on top of that. But uh, one of the encouraging things about um, African church history is that despite the fact that Christianity has been so largely associated with Western identity, the gospel actually has a longer track record in the African continent um, than it does even in the European continent in many significant respects. Uh, one of those being the fact that um, Christianity actually was extensively um, permeated throughout the African continent in late antiquity. Now, in late antiquity, when you're looking at the continent that we now call Africa, which the whole thing would have been called that. In fact, Africa would have just been a, a small part of the continent that we now call parts of Tunisia um, or parts of what we now call Tunisia. But in the continent that we now call Africa in late antiquity, there were really four major um, kind of urbanized civilizations. And that's the North African civilizations that at that time had been usurped and become Roman colonies in modern day Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria, uh, and Libya. And then there was also Egypt, which also uh, had at that time been uh, had been colonized as part of the Roman Empire. And then you also had uh, two major sub-Saharan African kingdoms that were called Kush or later Nubia, and then also Aksum, which is uh, the, uh, the predecessor of what's now modern to Ethiopia. And one of the encouraging things about ancient Africa 
uh, in, in, you know, kind of in these four major areas, which was the predominantly kind of the totality of urbanized uh, kingdoms in what's now called Africa, is that Christianity was present in all of these particular areas in, by the by the end of late antiquity. So still in the ancient time period, Christianity was all over all of these areas. Not only that, but Christianity by the time of the fourth and fifth centuries, Christianity was the dominant religion in all of these areas. Uh, so it wasn't just that Christianity was present, like it was in many parts of Asia or Europe as well, but it was actually the dominant religion. In fact, in the um, areas outside of the Roman Empire, like Nubia and Ethiopia, Christianity was freely embraced as the national religion of both of these nations, Ethiopia in the 4th century, or Axum, and then Nubia in the 5th century. And so that's another, I mentioned it briefly, but that's another important point, is that Christianity was freely embraced as the dominant religion in these ancient African civilizations. And so against the idea that, that again, Christianity came uh, in Africa or other places uh, solely by colonial force and slavery and, um, and imperialism, actually uh, long before that, uh, and also even long before many European nations even formed themselves and adopted Christianity as their national religion later on in the medieval period, African nations had already embraced Christianity as the dominant religion um, in, in Africa. And so that's another uh, important point that helps to round out uh, what we were talking about in that first lecture when we say that Christianity has always been a global religion. It's not, it didn't one day become a global religion centuries later, but it has been global from the get-go. Um, and not only that, but also connecting to this theme of gospel hymenote, that the, the expressions of Christianity that grew and developed in Africa and even across the entire continent going into uh, transatlantic uh, slave trade and even the African diaspora in the Americas, that the expression of Christianity was also very holistic or gospelist, to use this term, right? Um, that, uh, that, that, again, what is meant by gospelist is, meant, is, is one that sees no division uh, between truth and justice, but that they are uh, holistic, and these are all part of hymenal, part of faith. Um, and so, um, you know, one thing that I want to want to point out, even in this um, uh, example here of this image of a prayer book from the sixth century from Ethiopia, is uh, is again emphasizing this point that Christianity uh, literally took on African flavor and has done so uh, from the very beginning. The, you can see just from some of these images, this is one example of many of Ethiopian art uh, that goes back to antiquity, and this is actually still housed in an Ethiopian monastery that itself goes back to the 6th century um, uh, nearby uh, the, the old ancient capital of Axum. Uh, one, one thing we see is that biblical figures like Jesus and Mary and the apostles and also angels are depicted with black skin and with African features and African hair. And this is you know, these are these were drawn at a time when, uh, when especially in many other parts of the world, in Europe and even in the Near East, that black skin was often connoted and associated with depravity or ignorance or or um, lesser humanity. Uh, and again, this is you know at a at a time first in the trans-Saharan slave trade and the transatlantic slave trade uh, later on, where again blackness was often, especially theologically, associated with depravity. And in the face of all of that, you have in here African Christians depicting uh, depicting Jesus in a way that looks like them, embracing the idea against the anti-black sentiment that was common to the ancient world, embracing the truth and the reality that black people are made in the image of God. Um, and that uh, and that we are just as much made in the image of God as it, as everyone else, and and so uh, so you see the degree. This, just one example: um, uh, the degree to which Christianity was actually a an um, a liberating force uh, for uh, for Black people uh, to to really emphasize again the reality of Black people's being made in the image of God, and this uh, also gave way to a again a, a very liberative expression of Christianity. That uh, that was very gospelist again in the sense of being holistic and uh, and and seeing the liberative and also the uh, kind of theological orthodox aspects of Christian religion as one and the same. Another example of that that we see uh, going forward is in the life and in theology and ministry of one of the earliest African theologians named Shenouda of Atreet. Now Shenouda was a, a monastic leader in Egypt. He was an Egyptian who lived in southern Egypt and uh, in the um, uh, in the uh, three and four hundreds. And Shenouda actually was one of the most important leaders in what was called kind of communal monasticism or kenobitic monasticism. And this was a an expression or a tradition 
in Christianity that later would be imitated in uh, Northwestern Europe, but actually uh, in, in the Christian faith was mainly popularized and largely practiced in Egypt by African theologians like, like Shenouda. And in a lot of these monasteries, this was actually... The, this actually took off at a time period when, going back to that first lecture, when we were talking about how the 4th century was a time when Christianity in the Roman Empire was predominantly kind of becoming more and more associated with Roman imperialism and imperial power. And um, and when you started to have expressions of, of a um, kind of a uh, Christian religious nationalism, that in the at that same time that Christianity was being very popularized in the kind of Greco-Roman ethos, you also had a concurrent move in, by people like Shenouda and others who were starting these monastic communities that were purposed at living out a more radical and holistic expression of Christianity rather than uh, a kind of, again, a very um, comfort-seeking uh, nationalistic expression of Christianity. Uh, the, the monastic Christians were a lot more interested in in living in radical um, uh, solidarity with the poor and the oppressed and uh, and doing spiritual warfare um, in the deserts of, of not only Egypt, but also um, of, of in areas in the Near East and the Levant and Syria. And, um, and these, these communities of, of Christians were, again, very holistic in the degree to which they were um, teaching people Orthodox theology uh, and proclaiming the gospel, engaging in evangelism, and discipling people who would come in, and and uh, these were places of radical and communal discipleship, and so um, and 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 pagan uh, and non Christian theology was engaged with, and so there was a strong value on on orthodoxy and on right life saving belief in Jesus Christ, and at the same time there was a very um, decided effort at getting involved in issues of social justice. So there was no sense that you know, for example, the church's justice work and the church's if we can say truth work are somehow divided or, uh, or that they, uh, you know, have nothing to do with one another. Again, some of the statements that we're seeing come out in the American evangelical church today that are questioning the role of justice in the life of the church that we're seeing even this year, uh, in this past year, uh, where we're seeing that divide that I mentioned earlier, that century old divide where, uh, where some who, uh, you know, in the Christian church see the work of justice as somehow alien or even antithetical to the work of the church that such an idea most importantly, would have been foreign to the apostles and to the New Testament church, but also uh, would have been foreign even to um, the the development of a gospelist tradition in Africa and in the diaspora. Um, Shenouda, for example, uh, not only empowered the poor through economic development, through literacy, and and uh, through providing vocations and vocational training and jobs for Egyptians who would have been otherwise poor and likely impoverished and subject to uh, to wealthy land wealthy and oppressive landowners. Uh, Shenouda also advocated on behalf of these people and and was in touch with. Egyptians of every on every social level, but but clearly sided with the poor and the oppressed, and used his very prominent platform to critique uh, wealthy oppressive uh, people who were exploiting the poor, and and uh, um, we see an example of that here, where where Shenouda is praying on behalf of the poor who are being who are being ex economically and religiously exploited and persecuted by a wealthy pagan landowner named Gesius. And he is invoking the care of the Lord on, the, on behalf of the poor and also publicly condemning uh, the, pra the exploited practices of this, uh, of, of this um, wealthy neighbor of his. He says, Shenouda prays as he's preaching publicly in his monastic complex in the presence of hundreds, maybe even thousands of Egyptians that day. He says, have mercy on your people, O patient one, whose mercy is great and rescue them from the hand of those who oppress them. Like your people Israel of that era, and they will be still to know that there is no God, uh, no other God besides you. Do you not see that the Greeks, the Gentiles, and the godless people have been have not been able to know you because they have not ceased their ungodly lifestyle and all their impure deeds? Therefore, shut off every lawless deed and every injustice everywhere from those who are the recipients of injustice, injustice from the top of the earth to the end of the inhabited world. And those who know you will be still in order to serve you, for they will not be able to serve both you and the, perpetu the perpetrators of injustice. And so again, even in this little excerpt, 
from one of Shenouda's sermons. This was written in the Egyptian language. Uh, this is a translation of it. But Shenouda is actually the greatest writer in the history of the Egyptian language. Um, and, uh, and he also happens to be a Christian monk and theologian and advocate uh, for the poor and the oppressed. And notice, even in this little excerpt, the way that Shenouda's concern for orthodoxy um, and for understanding that, that there is no God other than Jesus Christ and right belief, and how that is completely weaved in seamlessly with his concern for justice and for um, the liberation of the poor. And notice how he, note, how he uh, takes for granted that God sides with the poor and the oppressed and, uh, and calls to right behavior those with power and with means. Um, so this kind of, again, gospel hymenote, this gospelist holistic expression was very, uh, again, Shenouda, it was very um, prevalent. It was, the, it was the assumed norm in much of early African Christianity. Shenouda was the greatest writer in the history of the language, and much of Coptic theology following was largely influenced by his holistic or gospelist vision of religion. Now, you know, going a little further south um, or going up the Nile into Ethiopia, uh, we, you know, there was also a very holistic hymenote. In fact, the word itself comes from Ethiopia and Eritrea, and and we see a very similar holistic expression of Christian theology. Uh, Egypt and Ethiopia, for for uh, over th for literally thousands of years, had a strong theological connection and religious tradition that continued to spread uh, throughout Africa. Um, and 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 in fact, we see some of the earliest expressions of human rights and uh, arguments. Uh, even before similar arguments were made, um, even by other philosophers. One of the earliest philosophers uh, in African history was a philosopher in the 17th century named Zara Yaqob, which means of the seed of Jacob. And Zara Yaqob was a Christian Ethiopian philosopher who wrote a text called the Hatata, which means inquiries. And he made, some of, he made very similar uh, inquiries into human knowledge and into the nature of God and the nature of truth uh, at a time that was you know, uh, contemporary to, or even before other similar, uh, European philosophers, you know, like Hume and Kant and Descartes and, and others. And, and, and again, he goes largely unnoticed, but in his, uh, in his philosoph philosophical inquiries, Zaria Kobe, as an African, one of the earliest African writers, uh, from sub-Saharan Africa made one of the earliest arguments for against slavery and also for the full equality of men and women. Um, at the, at the height of the trans-Saharan slave trade, when Ethiopia was was was, was uh, living in the midst of a vibrant and booming uh, Islamic slave trade across the continent of Africa, Zari Kobe made an argument against it, uh, which was largely being theologically uh, supported in uh, the the Middle Eastern world and across North Africa. But Zari Kobe says again, the Muslims say buying and selling human beings like an animal is right. Our intelligence, however, knows that this law of Islam does not come from the creator of human beings, who created us equal as brothers, so that we call our creator our father. Then Muhammad made the weak man the property of the strong. He equated an intelligent creature with an unintelligent animal. Can this depravity come from God? Now, Zaria Yaqob made this argument in the early 1600s, this abolitionist uh, anti-slavery argument in East Africa in the midst of the trans-Saharan slave trade, but at a time in the early 17th century when the transatlantic slave trade was also booming and continuing. And European colonialism made its way into Ethiopia at the same time, or attempted to, uh, in the early 1700s during Zaria Yaqob's time when uh, the Portuguese attempted to impose colonial rule in Ethiopia uh, and also bring Christianity, uh, bring European Christianity into an African nation that had already been Christian for uh, a millennia and a half, much longer than the Portuguese. And so Zari Kobe and other um, freedom fighters like Walata Petros, who is one of the first African women to have her own biography, fought against European colonialism and slave trade as well. And in addition to that, as I mentioned, Zari Kobe made one of the first uh, arguments in African literature for the full equality of men and women. Uh, notice what he says to uh, his future father-in-law upon the marriage of Zari Kobe with his wife. He says uh, to his father-in-law, Haptu, he says, And I said to my lord, Haptu, give me this girl that she may be my wife. And lord Haptu said to me, Certainly, from now on, she is not my maidservant, but your maidservant. I replied, Not my maidservant, but my wife. For husband and wife are equal in marriage. We should not call them master and maidservant, for they are one flesh and one life. And so again, uh, there was even, you know, re reformations of patriarchal culture within Ethiopia, led by 
Christian philosophers like Zahra Yacob and uh, women freedom fighters like Walata Petros, even in Ethiopian contexts. Um, and, and, you know, again, speaking of reformations, uh, there was even a reformation in Ethiopia led by a monk named Estefanos that was reforming many of the beliefs and practices of the dominant Orthodox Church. And this happened a century before Martin Luther uh, in Europe. And so, again, there have been so many movements towards freedom and justice uh, that, again, have been deeply attached to and have sprung from African Christians like Zara Yacob and Shenouda, who are also equally dedicated to the truth of the scriptures. So this, again, gospelist vision of hymenote or of theology of Christian religion has been at the heart uh, and soul of African Christianity from the beginning. Uh, as Christianity, again, has always been global, Christianity has also always been holistic um, and, and committed to truth and justice. Now, uh, uh, before I close, I just want to make a few comments about the diaspora because at, uh, a little known fact is that Christianity not only came into Africa freely uh, and was dominant in most of like, you know, kind of urbanized Africa from the time of late antiquity, but this Christianity also continued to spread across Africa. And so long before Portuguese and Belgian and English uh, colonial forces built slave castles and began to arrive on the shores of West Africa, um, you know, falsely in the name of Jesus, uh, but but also to uh, enslave Africans and um, to to continue to build Europe and also the the so-called New World in the Americas. But long before any of that happened, Christian.